So as we're reading, we need to make sure if we see something that, let's say, Cabeza de Vaca did, and we go, oh, I recognize it from one of these boxes down here. Come back, and we drag the box, and we put it with the explorer it belongs to. But be very careful that we don't accidentally um, move a box to the wrong explorer, because some of these might sound very similar. As we're reading, make sure that we're paying attention to which explorer is doing which uh, activity or why they were famous. That way we can make sure we put them in the right places. Okay. The other thing I want you to notice is that there are 10 different things here and there are only three explorers. So it's not going to be even for every single explorer. Some explorers might have more, some explorers might have less. We're going to go ahead and read through our information about these explorers and what they did and why they are famous. Explorers to Texas. With knowledge of a new world to the West, many brave Europeans set out on the dangerous journey of discovery and conquest. Like Columbus's journey, their paths did not always lead them to where they intended to go but their discoveries were no less significant. So like we had seen last time, uh, Columbus came over here and nobody in Europe knew that there was, there was stuff over here. So once they figured out that there was land over here, uh, everybody wanted to go and, and see what there was to see. And again, a lot of the kings and queens, they were the ones who were basically paying for these explorers to go because again this was a very expensive thing they did have to take a journey on a ship across the ocean which took a while uh, so the ship cost money all the supplies for the ship cost money and then you can't forget that they needed supplies once they were there as well all of that became very expensive the kings and queens would basically pay for these explorers to go they'd give them the supplies the money the, uh, the people that they needed, but remember the explorers had to do something for them. The explorers had to try to find whatever kind of gold or jewels or anything expensive and give it back or bring it back and give it to the king or queen. Number two, they had to make sure to promise that whenever they found land, land that nobody else from Europe had already come to, they had to claim it as land for that king or queen. So if they were uh, sailing over and the, let's say the queen of Spain had paid for their ship and for their supplies, then the queen would tell them, any land that you find belongs to me, belongs to Spain. And you need to tell everyone that, that it, that belongs to Spain now. If they were explorers for the, the king or queen of France, whatever land they found, the king or queen of France would say, you remember, you need to tell everyone that that land belongs to France now. It's French land. Cabeza de Vaca, Francisco Coronado, and René Robert Cavalier, Sir de La Salle, are among the earliest European explorers to Texas and provide us with a better historical understanding of the, la of the land we now call home. So these three explorers here were... Explorers that are, are famous even, even today. And they were explorers that specifically explored the area, the land that would eventually become Texas. So this first person here, this is a picture of Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca. Normally people shorten his name to just Cabeza de Vaca. Here on the map, we can see his route, his, the, where his travel took him. So this arrow over here is where he started. He starts out in Haiti, goes to Cuba, and he goes to Florida, goes around the coast of Florida, lands here in Galveston, and goes through Texas, down into Mexico, up back to Texas, and then around Mexico, eventually ending up in Mexico City, and then going to Veracruz afterward. So you can see that his, his path was a pretty long one. And he was kind of just going around everywhere. 
Cabeza de Vaca, an early explorer from Spain, was part of an expedition which set out in 1527 to settle and colonize an area in the New World thought to be near present-day Florida. Though his journey lasted far longer and was far more arduous than he had expected, Cabeza de Vaca never gave up. Like we saw on the map, he didn't plan. Originally, the plan was not for his journey to be this long or for it to take as long as it did. It was also a lot more difficult than he originally thought. When he was planning all this, he didn't think that it would be, it ended up being as tough of a journey as it ended up being. You know, you'll see in a bit why. He continued to live and learn over the eight years it took him to reach his intended destination. So his, his whole trip ended up taking eight years. Imagine that, a trip for eight years. It took him to reach his intended destination, and during his extended journey, sorry, this extended journey, Cabeza de Vaca spent much of his time in what is present-day Texas. He lived with Native Americans and learned about them and the Texas environment. He became a healer, an ethnologist, a person who studies different societies and cultures, and the first European merchant and historian to Texas. The knowledge he shared has contributed significantly to our understanding of Texas's past. So even though just this part of his journey was in Texas, this was most of his journey here. Spent a lot of time in what ended up being Texas. And because he spent so much time here, he did learn a lot about Texas and a lot about the people that lived here, the, the native uh, people that used to live here in Texas. He ended up learning from them. And because of what he learned and because of what he shared, the knowledge that he shared with other people, it helped out some of the other explorers, actually. And it helped us understand a bit more of, of Texas's past. So that's the, the section about Cabeza de Vaca. The next person we're going to be talking about is Francisco Coronado. This is Francisco Coronado, and here's the route that he took. Started out down here, went up through Mexico, through Arizona, New Mexico, spent time here in Texas, near the north part of Texas, the Panhandle, and then up through Oklahoma. But you can see that his route is a lot different from Cabeza de Vaca. Cabeza de Vaca spent most of his time here in southern Texas, and Coronado, most of his time in Texas, was in the northern part. Like Cabeza de Vaca, Francisco Coronado was another Spanish explorer who joined an expedition in 1540 to the New World. So both of them, Francisco Coronado and Cabeza de Vaca, both worked for Spain. King or Queen of Spain was the one who was uh, paying for their ships, for their supplies, who let them go. His charge was to find and conquer the seven cities of Cibolla, the seven cities of gold, an area full of riches and wealth that Cabeza de Vaca told tales of when he finally returned to Spain in 1537. So one of the reasons why Cabeza de Vaca is still um, so famous even today after all these years is, again, he, he came to Texas in 1527. That's when he left Spain. So he, he was here a long, long time ago. And the reason why he's still famous, why people still remember him, was because during his time here in Texas, he heard these stories from the Native Americans about Iboya, the seven cities of gold. And when he went back to Spain, when he finally got home, of course, that was one of the whole reasons why they went out here in the first place, was to find gold, to find riches, to get money. So when Cabeza de Vaca started telling people, there are cities made of gold, not just gold bars or gold pieces, an entire city 
made of gold. And not just one city, but multiple cities. Seven golden cities. Well, of course, everyone that wanted money started thinking, a whole city of gold? Well, if I could find the golden city, that's, that's a lot of gold that I could bring back, that I could have. One of the people that was going after those golden cities was Coronado. When he heard about this, the king and queen of Spain sent him out and said, go find him. Go, go, go look for him. And of course, it was important that they find it before anyone else from Europe, because if somebody else from Europe found them first, they could say, oh, well, it belongs to Spain or it belongs to, to France, not to Spain. You can't have this golden city. They wanted to be the first people from Europe to find these cities. In their search for this coveted land, Coronado and his men discovered the Grand Canyon and many other famous landmarks. So while he was traveling, and that kind of explains why you can see how long his route was. He was looking all over, trying to find these cities. And while he did, he was able to find some very important landmarks and other things. But, like it says here, while he never found the seven cities of gold, Coronado is credited as the first European to explore Palo Duro Canyon, a famous Texas landmark, and to traverse the northern part of Texas. So even though Coronado wasn't the first person to find the golden cities, and even though he wasn't able to complete that part of his, his mission, his task, he was able to find different landforms, and he was the first person from Europe to do that. He also was the first person from Europe to go and explore the northern part of Texas. Next person we're going to talk about is René Robert Cavalier Sur de la Salle. Now he's got a very, very long name, but normally when people talk about him, they shorten it to just La Salle. Here we have Two different routes for La Salle. We have this one, 1678 to 1682, starting out here, coming down the river. And then one, 1684 to 1687, going from this side and going here. Rene Robert Cavalier, Sir de La Salle was yet another European explorer to the New World. This French-born dreamer had hopes of finding a great river system that would lead to the Pacific Ocean and an easier passage to China. So this is the, the one explorer we're talking about that did not work for Spain. He worked for France. And he wanted to find a river that would lead to the Pacific Ocean, to the ocean on the other side. That might explain why he followed the Mississippi River. He was looking for a way, a waterway, a path across the United States to get to the other side. Or it would eventually be the United States. At the time, it was just land or different land. It wasn't the United States just yet, not all of it. The United States was mostly over here during this time. It hasn't yet spread all the way over here. He had also hoped to conquer Spanish territory and establish a French colony where the Gulf of Mexico meets the mouth of the Mississippi River. So he had another hope. Not only did he want to find some kind of river or passage from one side to the other, from one ocean to the other, he actually wanted to get land, more land, for... Hi, Christopher. He wanted to get more land for France. Remember, Spain had already been here. There were already explorers from Spain. What he wanted was to kind of go and claim land for France and maybe even get some land that used to belong to Spain or that people had already claimed for Spain and take it over for France. So he, he, a big motivation for him was land for France. Bella, put it away for now, baby. While his various missions to accomplish such tasks were unsuccessful, they were not futile. So even though he didn't really do what he wanted to, which is something he has in common with Coronado, 
neither of them really did what they wanted. It wasn't some, he didn't accomplish nothing. There were some things he was able to do. He established many French forts along the Great Lakes and Illinois, Ohio, and Mississippi rivers. But because he was following the rivers and the waterways, he was able to set up a lot of different forts for France along those waterways. That was really important because, again, these different countries from Europe are fighting over, well, this land belongs to Spain. No, it belongs to France. It belongs to Spain. It belongs to France. But if they were able to set up forts where they could leave soldiers, then it's harder for the other countries to come along and say, oh, well, this land is, is uh, Spanish land now. It belongs to Spain. Well, if there are French soldiers there, it's a lot harder to just say, oh, this is Spain's land. Because then the soldiers that are there from France would go, no, this is, this is French land. You need to leave. He formed friendships with n numerous Native American tribes. He gave Louisiana its name after the French king, Louis Louis the Fourteenth, and though short-lived, he managed to establish a French settlement in Spanish territory on the Texas coast at Matagorda Bay. So the whole state of Louisiana, well, what is now the state of Louisiana? Back then, it was a much different shape and much larger. But at the time, he named it Louisiana because he was naming it after the French king, Louis the Fourteenth. He also did manage to do a little bit of what he, wa uh, what he originally wanted to do. He did set up a French settlement in territory that belonged to Spain. So Spain had already explored much of this area. They had already claimed much of this area, but he was able to set up a French, a French settlement, a French town on Spanish territory. Though their journeys were often filled with difficulties and disappointments, Cabeza de Vaca, Francisco Coronado, and René Robert Cavalier, Sir de La Salle, were three European explorers that made significant contributions to history and remind us that struggle is often the price of success. The one thing that is common with all three of these explorers is, honestly, they didn't have a super easy time of what they did. We even saw that a lot of them didn't really do what they had originally wanted to. We know Cabeza de Vaca didn't think that his journey would be quite so long and take so much time. There were a lot of problems that he encountered along his journey. Many, many issues. There were shipwrecks and all sorts of things that happened to him. And his journey was much tougher than he thought it would be. Francisco Coronado thought he could just go and find the seven cities, and that would be it. Be quick, done, over with but he didn't find them ever. He found some other things that he wasn't looking for, but he didn't find the seven cities. La Salle wanted to find a way to get from one side of what would become the United States to the other side, hopefully one big river that they could just sail through, but didn't find that either. So now, like I said, what you're going to do is you're going to look at these blocks here sorry some of them there's some like invisible boxes if you find those you can just move them off to the side we don't need them. but you're going to take these boxes here and you're going to drag them put them in whichever explorer you think they match up so if you need to go back read the story again or read the information again and match up the boxes to the explorer that you think they go with. 